yeah, thanks for the invitation to speak here. Um, I um, and I'll, I'll do my best to try to make this, uh, uh, I don't know, understandable. Um, also, I, 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 you know, when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see anything. Um, and so if there's any questions, please interrupt and, and let me know. Um, okay, so I want to talk about large civ inequalities um, and I'm interested in large civ inequalities, especially interested in large civ inequalities for um, families of L functions or, or families of automorphic forms. And um, so I'd like to just start with just the slide is just for a little bit of notation uh, to talk more about what I what I want. Um, so I want um, this script F to be um, a family of automorphic forms. And um, most of the time, I'll mainly be interested in the L functions associated to these. So, so you don't really lose much by just thinking about families of L functions, if, if you prefer that. Um, so an L function has a Dirichlet series. I want to write the, the coefficients as lambda f of n. Um, I want to normalize uh, the uh, functional equation so that it um, relates s and 1 minus s. Um, yeah, an L function has a, uh, there's a, there's the sort of the Dirichlet series part, the, the uh, and then the finite part, if you like, and then there's a, uh, a gamma factor or maybe a product of gamma factors uh, that uh, are included in the, the, to make the completed L function. And that's the, the gadget that has the, 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 the nice functional equation. Um, and so the, the gamma factors will be some product of, uh, let's say D, um, where D is the degree, um, uh, gammas with some shifts. So gamma, um, gamma of S plus some numbers kappa J. Uh, Okay, and so um, that's what the, the L function looks like. Um, so now one of the, okay, so if you, have, if you wanna know what a family of L functions is um, or a family of automorphic forms, well, it's, we, I think we all have some good ideas of what we think of as a family, um, family here, but it's really hard to come up with a, a rigorous mathematical definition of what, of what a family is. Um, and so I'm not really gonna try to address that at all. Um, but I do want to say that one of the properties that a family should have um, is uh, just in order to actually work with it is it should have some kind of orthogonality relation. So there should be some kind of formula that lets us average over the family. If, if we don't have that, then I mean, how can, how can we do anything with a family um, if we can't even aver do you know, average anything over the family? Um, so we'd like to average here I just wrote products of, of, a, of a, one of these Dirichlet series co coefficients and its complex conjugate. Um, so we'd like to be able to have some kind of formula that lets us average this, um, uh, just as a, as a bare minimum uh, thing we'd like to know. So often uh, in practice, this will take the form that will have some kind of uh, D, so D is supposed to stand for like some kind of diagonal uh, term. Um, and um, E is supposed to be some kind of error term. So often if M and N are close to each other and close could mean like close as real numbers or it could mean something else, um, but uh, we wanna think of it as M and N are, are close in some um, appropriate sense, then if that's true, then this should be approximately one. And then um, this E of MN, we often will, will want to show that it's small um, on average over, let's say M and N perhaps. Um, and um, if M and N are, are, typically what happens is if M and N are quite small and the size of the family becomes large, then, then this is a reasonable thing. And we could say that this error term is small in a, in a kind of a pointwise sense. Um, if we want M and N to be larger, then this becomes quite problematic. Um, and, uh, and, but maybe we can prove that it's sort of small on, on average over M and N. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we can we can do with this kind of family. Um, oh, okay, so this slide, this is just saying what I just said verbally. Um, okay, so the main uh, thing I want to discuss in this talk are um, involve large civ inequalities and especially large civ inequalities for a family of um, automorphic forms or L functions. So large civ inequality is a um, 
bound on this kind of bilinear form. Um, and so the way I've arranged it here is we've got our family on the outside and we have a sum of these Dirichlet series coefficients with some numbers a sub n uh, that are completely arbitrary. And um, we want to bound, um, and that's this, we'll call this delta. Delta is this norm of, the, of this, uh, this thing, um, and times the L2 norm squared of the coefficients. Okay, and so the large sub inequality, it's very important that we're asking uh, for a bound that uh, does not depend on an in any way, except through you know, just measuring the L2 norm um, or L2 norm squared of the, of the numbers. Um, as you might think, uh, we, we, you know, when you have, when you're trying to prove a bound, uh, you know, better bounds are, 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 are better. <laughs> so uh, we'd like to prove this with, with delta as small as possible. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, so I have some things to say here. So one thing is, so one reason um, historically that we wanted um, uh, arbitrary coefficients was that for some problems, uh, that we're interested in, it's very hard to use any properties of the coefficients. So for example, if a n, like what if the a n's ran over um, primes or, uh, or, or like a n was one if n was a prime and zero otherwise, or a n could be the, the Mobius function or, or something else or some, you know, or all sorts of more complicated um, things like this. Um, uh, and so for these kinds of problems, it's, it's just so hard to get any structure from those coefficients that one of the, the big uh, breakthroughs, the big gains was to just uh, do things for arbitrary coefficients, just completely try and just, oh, was there a question? <laughs> okay, um, so, the, so the, yeah, so just to, you know, if we can't do anything for a specific uh, vector or coefficients, then just do it for all, all at once. Um, and somehow uh, getting rid of any of that structure uh, helps make progress. Uh, or, or, but anyway, yeah. And so another, um, another thing to say is that um, I, would, I would say that, uh, uh, that this number delta or this quantity delta, it's a, I guess it's a function of the family and, and might depend on n. Um, uh, so this, this quantity is, is a way of measuring how much we know about our family. I'm not saying it's the only way to measure how much we know about our family. Um, I'm not saying it's a perfect measure, but it's a fairly good measure. It's a good, it's a good way to say something about how much we understand about a family. Um, and so, uh, so this is, this, is, this is one reason I'm interested in this. I, I re really wanna understand families of L functions. And, um, and so this is a good way to do that. Okay, so let's just uh, say just say a little bit about what 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 goes on here. So if we um, just start with this expression, um, if we square this thing out and use our orthogonality formula that we're hypothesizing um, holds, then um, we've got some kind of diagonal term and some kind of error term. Um, for the sake of argument, just to make things simple, let's just say that this diagonal term really is like a Kronecker delta symbol. So it's one if m equals n and zero otherwise. If we do that, then this uh, diagonal term really just does become the, the size of the family here times the L2 norm squared of the coefficients. Um, so you just visibly see that term um, popping out. And then, um, and then the hard part then is to bound the, the error term on average over M and N with these arbitrary coefficients. Okay, so let's do some examples. Um, so first, let's talk about GL1. So for, for, for GL1 families, uh, those are um, correspond to Dirichlet characters. And so there's the, the this is the most classical um, large sieve inequality, although, you know, I guess the, probably it was thought of for additive characters, not multiplicative, but let's, let's not worry too much about that. Um, so, um, so this family is all Dirichlet characters. So the star means primitive. So all primitive Dirichlet characters mod Q and little Q goes up to capital Q. So there's roughly Q squared um, of these um, things. Um, and so here we've got this Q squared um, appearing there. That's uh, the size of the family. We sort of saw that already from the kind of the, the diagonal term. And then we have this second um, term, uh, this plus N and then the L2 norm squared. 
Um, so some of the big applications for this were for the Bombieri Vinogrado theorem, um, which uh, tells us about primes in arithmetic progression, um, bounds on moments of, of L functions, uh, zero density estimates, all, all sorts of, of great things. So there was uh, uh, a, a vast amount of work done on um, this family and, 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 and applications of this. Um, Right, and so another thing, so this is related to the bombieri vinogradov theorem, but this tells us in a quantitative sense that primes are well distributed in arithmetic progressions on average. And it's a way to say, like, so the, the generalized Riemann hypothesis tells us for individual moduli that we have strong um, uh, knowledge about how primes are distributed in arithmetic progressions, um, but this tells us something of a similar strength, but on average. And so for some, problems, uh, you only need to know uh, what's happening on average. And so this is a substitute for the generalized Riemann hypothesis for those kinds of problems. Um, okay, another um, GL1 family um, is uh, more recent, uh, uh, I think in the 1990s or early 2000s, I don't remember now, um, Heath, result of Heath Brown. And so what this is, is uh, all the quadratic characters. So 1995. 1995, okay, <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, so let, here are the stars supposed to represent, let's say odd square free integers. And then, so this N over Q is just the Jacobi symbol. And then, um, um, okay. And so this is uh, like a, a thin subset of this family. So this family, uh, before it was all characters mod Q, all, or all primitive characters mod Q and all, all moduli, these are only the quadratic characters. So there's roughly constant times Q of these uh, 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 characters. And so this is a much smaller set. And, um, but he nevertheless, he gets this bound to this Q and then we see this plus N again. Um, and then there's this extra factor QN to the epsilon um, that I'm, I'm not gonna worry too much about um, for this talk. Um, and so it's, this is a uh, much, I would say, much harder result than the previous one. Uh, and has nice applications to quadratic twists of L functions. Uh, okay, so this is, so these are two families uh, for GL1. There's a famous um, GL2 family um, of going, of, of Desi and Ivania. So this goes back to maybe 1979, is that right, Valentin? <laughs> Uh, 81, I don't know. It feels like an odd number year. Um, yeah, I think it's 1980, 80, 81, something like that. Okay. Okay. And um, so, right. And so what is this? Okay, so this is a GL2 family. So this is all, um, you could take it to be all um, MOS forms of, of level Q. And this T sub F is supposed to be the spectral parameter. Um, so T sub F being at most T essentially means that the Laplace eigenvalue is at most T squared. So it actually means it's at most a quarter plus T squared. Um, w F is a weight. Um, it's a natural weight that appears um, in the proof. Um, and it's the um, residue of a GL GL2 cross GL2 L function. Um, if you're not familiar with this, I would just ignore this, just pretend like this is, is one, um, but it's, uh, we do have some control on, on the sizes of these, but that's uh, uh, harder. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't known at the time that Desi and Ivani has uh, proved this result. Um, but anyway, so they um, get this term QT squared. This is the diagonal term again. So the, the number of these um, MOS forms of this level and, uh, spectral parameter of this size grows like Q times T squared, um, and they get this plus N. Um, the same method works for um, holomorphic modular forms of level Q and weight going up to T. Um, it's the more or less the same thing. Um, but I didn't state that result or, 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 or put it on a slide at least. Okay, so I want to define, um, I wanna call it the optimistic bound. So the optimistic bound for a family is the bound where you have the size of the family plus N and just as like a little 
safety valve is put in the size of the family times n to the power epsilon. Okay. Um, so the previous GL1 and GL2 large sieve inequalities that we stated um, all are of this shape. So they all match the optimistic bound. Um, I want to show you in a, in a little bit that we can't ever improve on the optimistic bound. So this is really the best possible thing we could hope for up to this, this thing to the power epsilon and, and other small factors that um, I don't want to concern myself with for this talk. Um, okay, so let's say, I want to explain why that's the optimistic bound is the, if it's true, it's the optimal bound. So one thing to say is that, so we saw by looking at like the family average, we saw that term, like that diagonal term appearing that gave us the size of the family. We also had that plus N. So what's going on with that plus N? Um, so one thing we could do is we could pick our coefficients a sub n to perfectly correlate with um, your favorite element in the family. So pick your favorite f, let's call it g, let's choose a n to be the complex conjugate of the lambda g's. Um, and then by dropping all but that one term with f equals g, you get um, this sums of squares of your, of your uh, Dirichlet series coefficients for g, and then all, all squared. And so this should be around size n squared, ignoring things like n to the epsilon and, and things like that. Um, so this should be true, okay? So it should be at least n squared. Um, and then if you, and then the sum of the a n squares, that's the LT norm squared of the vector, that's of size n. So this kind of argument shows that delta is at least n or n to the one minus epsilon. So already, if you kind of believe that you've got this diagonal term that's sitting there that we can't improve upon, and then we also have this n, this indicates we shouldn't be able to prove on delta plus n. That's a little hand wavy. Um, so, you know, one 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 you know heuristic that might help is just to say, well, okay, the sum of the a n lambda f of n, just for, forget a, you know, just think about a n being one or something like that. We should get about at best square root cancellation in here. And so this thing should be size of the family times square root of n quantity squared. And that gives us this diagonal term. So that matches the diagonal. Um, we can make this more rigorous using um, duality, uh, which I want to explain um, in um, an upcoming slide. Uh, but if you put these two things together, this explains why you can't improve on the optimistic bound. Um, Okay, oh yeah, so I guess the duality slide is the next one. Um, so here's the duality um, principle. So it's very important in these uh, large sieve questions. So let's say we have, I mean, one way to think about it is just with finite matrices. Um, AMN is some matrix of elements. And what we're doing here is sort of taking this matrix, multiplying it by an arbitrary vector. Um, and you get uh, another vector, and then you're adding up the entries squared. So it's the length of that vector squared. Um, and then this other thing is sort of doing the, doing the same process, but on the other side, like you're taking your, uh, I mean, it's a, I guess you can think about taking the, the adjoint of your matrix and doing the same, pro or that what they call it. It's just the com conjugate transpose of, of the matrix. Um, and anyway, so there's a basic uh, uh, fact from this finite dimensional linear algebra that these two norms are the same. The norms of these two operators are the same. Um, okay, and so that means that for this problem, um, if we want to bound the, this norm delta, if we wanna have our family average on the outside, um, we could just as well, um, prove this by taking the family average on the inside and the sum over n on, on the outside. Um, but these are these equivalences are for arbitrary coefficients. So this is part of the power. Um, so by giving up any properties of the coefficients, we're able to use the duality principle. Um, okay. So um, right. So this is so this is like this is using the duality principle where that matrix, like that A M N matrix, that's this lambda F of N. So it's parameterized by F and N. 
So by switching the roles between F and N, that's how you kind of switch between the, the, two, uh, the two sides. Okay, so you might be tempted to just conjecture that the optimistic bound is true. So I'm not conjecturing that the optimistic bound is true because it's not true. Um, <laughs> one, one important example um, for why it's not true um, goes back to um, this paper of um, Ivanius and Xiaoxing Li from 2007. So they looked at a family of um, cusp forms on gamma one of Q. So this is like um, gamma zero of level Q with a character and then varying over the character. Um, so this is like a, it's, uh, anyway, so this family is, is, is interesting and um, it's rather subtle that, and they showed that it does not satisfy the, the, the optimistic bound. Okay, so this is a good example to have in mind uh, when studying these things because it's it's just indicating well you can't just always expect that the optimistic bound is true. There has to be um, some something going on. Um, we don't really understand what you know what what we need to be true in order to predict the, that the optimistic bound is true. Uh, it's one of the things that I think that makes this uh, area interesting. Um, okay, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about um, that example, the Ivani like, and Lee example. It's just always in the, the back of my mind. Um, but I, I have um, noticed that there, there are some um, instances of uh, cases where the optimistic bound isn't true because of um, what I want to call biased sets. So, um, so let's define that. So this is this is a much simpler uh, kind of phenomenon than um, what we saw with uh, Ivaniets and Lee. So the script n will be a subset of n to two n, um, and let's say that this set is biased if when you sum over this um, subset of the lambda f of n's. It, basically, there's no cancellation along that subset. Okay, so this thing should be at least uh, the size of this uh, set. Um, and this twiddle uh, greater than or equal to just means uh, uh, whatever I want it to mean, which means <laughs> uh, let's, let's just imagine that it incorporates any kind of quantities to the epsilon power or negative epsilon power, this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a biased set of a certain cardinality. Then you can just, um, in the large subtype problem, you can take an to be the characteristic function of this sequence. If you plug that in, um, the sum of the an lambda f of n, of course, is just the sum of lambda of n over this biased set. And then this inner sum is basically of size n. And so it gets squared and then it's multiplied by the size of the family. And then this is then the cardinality of f times the cardinality of this bias set times the L2 norm squared of this vector. And so we're getting a term that's cardinality of F times something. So the, remember the optimistic involved involved the cardinality of F plus N, capital, capital N. Um, and so if the size of the family is big, um, to do, is bigger than the length of summation, then as long as this has even a little bit of size, then, uh, this thing will, will disprove the, um, uh, the optimistic bound, right? Because this, this, this will tell us that delta of Fn is at least F size of F times the size of N, and that's bigger than the size of F, you know, unless this, this thing has size N to the epsilon. So you're allowed to have, you know, very tiny um, biased sets. Okay, so that's, that's what a bias set is. So here are some examples of some bias sets. So let's let F be just all the primitive quadratic characters. Let's just say of conductor up to X, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter very much. And let's take script N just to consist of all the squares in this dyadic interval, okay? So when you have a quadratic character and you evaluate it at a square, it always takes the value plus one, although occasionally it's zero, but the zeros are so sparse that it doesn't matter. Um, and so this set uh, is a biased set of size about square root of n. Okay, so um, so even though our outer sum, this, the the family sum, is over primitive characters, the we have a biased set, 
And um, Heath Brown's result, which is, remember, was over the square free, that was over the, these primitive quadratic characters, it avoided this problem by having that the sum over n on the inside was over square free numbers. Um, and so that was very important uh, uh, in his uh, proof. And so this, I mean, it's, it's, this is easy to see in this example that, the, that this would be a biased set, but anyway, it, it fits into this framework. And it shows that if we just scroll back, um, in this level of generality, where we only have a family, some you know, nice family of, of L functions, that the inner sum over n, we have to worry about um, what set we're running over. It might be sensitive to the family when we have to avoid biased sets. So we have to, and it might be hard to see like what is a biased set with our given family. Okay, so that was the quadratic character biased set. Um, where was I? Oh, okay. So here's another example, a little less trivial. Um, or, or it takes a little more work to see that this is a biased set. So let's look at symmetric squares of GL2 cusp forms. Okay, so GL2 cusp form, um, use, let's say it's U sub J with a spectral parameter of size capital T. The symmetric squares are these uh, lifts to GL3 of these, uh, of these GL2 cusp forms. Um, <clears throat> so if we just take the family of GL of symmetric squares, it turns out there's a biased set. Um, and the bias set, again, is the is could be the squares, let's say, of, of primes. It's just easier to work with primes, but uh, um, yeah. So let's, let's, let's not worry too much about, about more general sets than, than primes uh, or squares of primes. So I claim that this is a biased set um, of size square root of n over, over log of n. And the reason is um, that there's a Hecke relation. So the, the the Dier, the, the Dirichlet series coefficient, the p squared Dirichlet series coefficient of the symmetric square L function um, is one plus the p squared <laughs> Dirichlet series coefficient of the GL2 MOS form. Okay, so this is just a, um, you know, the kind of thing you just look up at, you know, the, the formulas for these. Uh, uh, for, uh, for, for these things. And, um, and so this is, this is the relation. Um, now this thing, the, the, when you average over the family, these, these, these lambda P squares basically cancel out to, to zero on average. Um, but the one obviously does not. And so there's some, you know, there's some noise, like this, this thing isn't, it's, 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 it's canceling out, but then there's this plus one that's sitting there. So this is a little, little different than the previous family where it was always just plus one with no, no real error term. Here we have something that's oscillating, but this is enough drift uh, that it points in the direction of plus one. And so this shows that um, there's a biased set of this size. Oops. So um, yeah, so anyway, so this is kind of an interesting thing. I was a little bit surprised when I first uh, Notice that this this happens, um, and so the, the lesson is we have we have to be careful about these bias sets and and, and worry about them. Um, it can be kind of hard to figure out because you have to look at any kind of subsequence. So if you can find bias along any kind of subsequence, then you have to worry about that. And there's lots of possible subsequences you could be looking at. Um, but for multiplicative functions, like the, these these coefficients are multiplicative. It, um, it might be a little easier to do that to, to get a to get a, a good and get at least get a good guess on what could what the biases could be. Like you might just study prime, just look at prime powers and then expand out multiplicatively. So you might only look at um, primes, prime squares, prime cubed, and, and so on. Okay, so this is a um, uh, I don't know. This this is just some 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 things that I I was interested in that 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 happened for this. Now for the for the rest of my talk, uh, I want to um, focus on a, um, a GL3 family. So we saw for some GL1, good GL1 families, we've got good um, uh, large sieve inequalities for GL2. We've got some good ones, although it's maybe not as complete in GL2 still. Um, and But GL3 is uh, very incomplete. Um, so um, anyway, so I want to focus on GL3 for the rest of this talk. 
So let's let f be a Heckamas cusp form for SL3Z. Um, it has some Fourier Whitaker coefficients, uh, so it's parameterized by pairs of integers. Um, the the L function associated to just one of these cusp forms just samples only at the second one, um, so one comma n. Um, this is a degree three L function. It has a, a three gamma factors. Um, let's write the these shifts as alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. The alphas sum up to zero, um, and the alphas should be real. Um, the raman newton selberg conjecture predicts that they're, they're real. Um, so for this talk, let's just uh, imagine that they're all real. Um, so the first thing we'd like to know is how many of these things are there. So there's a good um, asymptotic formula um, due to Lapid and Mueller that counts the number of these, um, like in some large uh, ball. Um, so we could might we might bound the alphas and some. Uh, all, let's say all the alphas are most t. Or, um, then uh, so it turns out that the number of um, um, these GL3 MOS forms in this in this uh, large region is grows like t to the fifth. And they actually get a um, good enough asymptotic formula that they can count um, mass forms in smaller regions inside here. Um, and so, um, for example, um, we could look at um, a small, like the small, basically the smallest kind of box we could look at is something like this. So we could take alpha one to be in an interval of length one. So let's say it's just for the sake of argument, let's say it's like 2t plus big O of 1. Big O of 1 just means some finite interval, let's say. Um, alpha 2, let's say, is t plus big O of 1. And then alpha 3 is forced to be, is determined by alpha 1 and alpha 2 because they sum up to 0. So this will be minus 3t plus some here, small big O of 1. The number of boss forms in a small box like this grows like t cubed. Um, OK, so now. One of the main tools uh, for studying families, uh, I didn't even mention this for GL2, but if we go back to the, um, the Desier and Ivanius result on the, for, the, for GL2, the main tool is the Kuznet cell formula. That's our averaging formula. Um, and so we, the GL2 Kuznet cell formula has been used a, um, a lot. We are, um, uh, I don't know, many, many of us are, have gotten used to it, uh, some of the, and strange intricacies with all these integral transforms involving vessel functions and such. Um, <clears throat> there is a GL3 because that's how formula, but it's a lot more complicated. Um, and I really don't want to state it uh, precisely, um, but roughly speaking, it gives it's, a, it's our averaging formula. So it's an average with a weight here. Um, you can put in a pair of, uh, of these Fourier coefficients of, of with lambda bar and another pair with lambda. And then you get some kind of sum of these GL3 Klosterman sums. And um, it's, we have two moduli. We have D1 and D2, and they both range over integers. Um, another thing to say is the left-hand side, it doesn't just contain the, um, the cusp forms, but, but it also contains um, various kinds of Eisenstein series. Um, also, the right-hand side contains there's there's other types of these Klosterman sums. There's a um, there's a diagonal term, and also I didn't write down the complicated integral transform. Um, so this is just very much kind of an impressionistic view of these of the two sides. Um, I, to, be, to be fair, I'm not really using I don't for the for what I'm discussing I I'm, I don't really I'm not really using this formula um, at least not directly. Um, but I just wanted to say a little bit about what, 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 what's going on here. So I, I also, I don't want to define these Klosterman sums in general, um, but if you um, uh, make some simplifying assumptions, you can see there's, there's sort of two types of behavior that are sort of fighting each other. So if D1 and D2 are relatively prime, then this, this GL3 Klosterman sum with these two moduli factors as a product of two Klosterman sums, one of modulus D1 and one of modulus D2. Um, and, but we see, you see this D2 appearing here 
um, as an argument inside the Klosterman sum. So D2 modulo D1 matters, and similarly D1 modulo D2 matters. And so um, that's, that's kind of complicated to work with. So D1 and D2 are not at all separated from each other. There, there's some interaction between those two variables. Um, and another extreme, like the, the, you know, the other extreme from two numbers being co-prime is if they're equal. And let's just take them to be equal and let's say prime. Um, and also let's assume the prime is, is, does not divide n1, n2, m1, and m2. In this case, this GL3 Klosterman sum just collapses as p plus one. So there's no possible cancellation that can happen in these, amongst these kinds of things. Um, we might expect lots of cancellation in these product of Klosterman sums, but there's no cancellation that could happen here. Um, and so these, anyway, so we get these two kinds of behavior and it's sort of hard. One of the hard parts about trying to work with this is that you've got these two things that are happening at the same time and you have to try to deal with them both. Um, so I wrote down a, I, I took a screenshot and figured out how to attach it. So this is this is the general form. This is the more, this is the general formula. So that generalizes these two cases um, due to Blomer and, and, and Buck Kane. And I, I, I didn't want you to look at it very much. So this is just to indicate again that why this is uh, a hard subject. Um, but there might be some hope for some simplification. So there was a recent paper of Kirill Nakasuji that discovered a simplified formula for the Klosterman sum um, that looks like this. And, um, the, and um, I'm curious, I, I haven't tried, um, but it, it might be uh, worthwhile to see if, how, how useful this formula is for um, you know, some other, for, for other problems. Okay, so using that that global decomposition formula, amongst other tools, um, Blomer and Buckane proved a, um, a bound on this, uh, this family, this GL3 family. Um, and so here um, I'm stating the result for the, the small box, so for a box of side length one. So just think of like that alpha one is 2t plus big O of one, alpha two is t plus big O of one, and, and so on. Um, so for that small box, they get a bound that's um, t cubed, so t cubed is the size of the family, and then the second term is this t squared n. Okay, and second of all, this, this bound is um, optimal. Um, this is kind of surprising. So if, if you know, the, the optimistic bound would be t cubed plus n, okay, but their n is much larger, so they've got n times t squared, so they've got, so this is much larger. Um, and so, um, yeah, so it's kind of surprising that this is the optimal bound. Um, it should say that this is, um, um, the optimality comes from looking at uh, the larger domain, not just the small box. So I think for the small box, it's actually not clear if this is optimal, but what is true is I know you cannot improve upon t times n. So it's still, the optimistic bound is still not true for this, for the small box. Um, anyway, so this is just a, a, a kind of a technical point. So let's not dwell on that. So how does this optimality go? So what they do is they um, construct a vector um, that, that um, correlates with the Eisenstein series. So there's some, there's all these Eisenstein series. Um, and um, in particular, there's these Eisenstein series that are induced from SL2Z um, cusp forms. And so by looking at that part, so remember this family um, here uh, is, has the cusp forms and the Eisenstein series um, together. Um, and, so the, and so it's the Eisenstein series part that's responsible for the large uh, main term. Okay, so in that sense, we're done, right? So they've got an upper bound and they've, and they've shown a lower bound that, that matches it. Um, so you might say, is this the end of the story? And well, um, no. And so when the, the reason is, so the, the, the lower bound comes from the Eisenstein series, okay? So what happens if we don't include the Eisenstein series? Um, then what happens? 
Okay, so what, what if we only look at the cusp forms? So um, I have a results uh, to, to finally <laughs> finally state uh, in this talk that uh, so let's take F zero that stands for the cusp forms, and let's look at the small box, so the side length one box that has size t cubed. Um, um, then there's a bound on this, and um, so it's t to the fifth um, plus n, and then it's t cubed n to the two thirds. Um, and so for large n, so this, so this is going to be good for, for large n. So in particular, uh, you can do a little calculation and, and check that if n is bigger, a bit bigger than t cubed, then this is better than um, what you get from the Bloomer and Buckingham bound. Um, of course, everything works for the cusp form and the Eisenstein series. This is only for the cusp form. So this is better than the bound you get by um, you know, overextending, including the Eisenstein series, and then applying the bound. But it's, it's, it's implied by this. Uh, okay, so if n is large than this, this larger than t cubed, then the, this bound is better. So um, okay, another thing to say. So there's some recent work of Thorner and um, Zaman that also they improved on this Bloomer and Buckingham bound for large values of n. Um, I'll try to say more about their work and how it's um, how, how what I do is different from them. So by the way, um, is, is the talk supposed to be fifty minutes or one hour or some other number? To... <laughs> uh, one hour is good. Okay. Um, all right. I'll definitely stop before that. I'm just keeping track of the time. Can I ask you a question, Matt? Yes. Uh, I, I was just, uh, as you're speaking about the uh, lipid Mueller uh, result, I was a bit worried about uh, uh, existence of, uh, so, so, so I, I would imagine if you restrict to a, an O of one box that you can, that, that they give upper bounds, but do they also give lower bounds in that for an O of one box? Maybe you don't need them for in the, for your result, but maybe for optimality you might need. Um, I thought that they got an asymptotic on a scale of that size, but I haven't looked at their paper in a while. Um, I also seem to think that with even with these weights, um, with uh, you could use. I feel like you could use the Kuznetsov formula and bound the error term and still get the main term, but I mean. Might not be remembering correctly. Yeah. So, so technically speaking, Lapid Müller need the principal congruent subgroup, or no? They, they don't need the principal congruent subgroup, but they they need they need some level in order to get rid of the elliptic terms. Um, this is just an annoying technicality, but I, I, I think so. Very strictly speaking, it would not apply. I think to SL three Z, but I that see. that is not a big deal. Um, but yeah, I think at least if you, I mean, certainly if you make this this O of one ball an O of t to the epsilon ball, yeah, yeah, uh, that's then what it really might is. be hard yeah. to get lower bounds, and um, yeah, either by the trace formula or by the Kuznetsov formula or in in some other way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Um, okay. So where was I? Yeah. So I'll. Okay. So Thorner and Zeman, I'll try to mention. How their work differs um, as we go. Um, although I might forget, I'll try to remember. <clears throat> okay, so the method of proof is well. So here, here's 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 one thing to start with. Um, going back, whenever basically whenever you have a family like this, um, you might think that um, if n is kind of small relatively small um, compared to the size of the family, that's the range where you want, would want to use your family averaging technique, like your Kuznet cell formula, or um, just whatever whatever formula you have for averaging. If it's, uh, you know, Heath Brown's case, it would be a plus one summation formula. Um, okay, so, um, but if N is, is, is large compared to the size of the family, then you wouldn't expect that that family averaging method to be um, too effective, and so um, um, so 
so the idea is, um, so you can see already that this improves on large values of n. So we, we should um, arrange things so that n is on the outside. We should use the duality principle and make n be on the outside and the family be on the inside. Because you always want your averaging to be on the, uh, the, the longer averaging to be on the outside because that gives you more structure. Um, so that's the idea. So the starting point or the, the, the starting idea is to use duality. Um, and so take the sum over n on the outside. Now the rough idea, um, the, the plan of attack is to, okay, so maybe we should smooth this out, put in a nice smoothing function by positivity, that's fine. Um, square this out and we'll get a Dirichlet series and it should be related to a um, GL3 cross GL3 um, rankin selberg L function. And we'd like to apply the functional equation to shorten the sum. So if, if n is large enough, uh, then, uh, you know, there's this basic principle that the, the length of summation um, times the dual length of summation is equal to the conductor. And so if the original length of summation is bigger than the square root of the conductor, here the conductor of this GL3 cross GL3 thing, um, then the dual sum will be shorter and then there should be a gain in doing that. Um, okay, that's, so that's the rough strategy. Oh, and then, um, and then, um, basic, basic, basically, I can say here, I guess, how, how my um, approach differs from Thorner and Zeman. So they, what they do is they basically use the power of the functional equation um, in a, an indirect way by going to, um, they, 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 they use duality and they shift contours and they go to, um, in their case, they would go to the zero line and apply the convexity bound. Um, and so what I'm going to do is actually apply the functional equation, get a new length of, get a new summation on the dual side out. And then um, now what that has done is that's flipped us into a range where N is small compared to the size of the family. And then we can apply a family averaging bound, which is provided by Bloomer and Buckane's result that I mentioned earlier. So we can then apply that and, and then um, improve on things um, for a larger N. But there's some issues. So the first issue is that the rankin selberg L function is not what you get when you just square this thing out. So if you just naively square, square this out and sum over n, the Dirichlet series you get looks like this. So it's lambda f of one n, lambda g bar of one n um, over n to the s. And this is uh, some kind of Dirichlet series. Uh, it's related to the rankin selberg but it's not equal to the rankin selberg The rankin selberg is this. Um, and so you've got M and N appearing. Um, you've got this M squared here, and there's also the sum over D with the D cubed. Um, you could also write that as zeta of three S if you um, prefer. Um, so this is the right object that has the nice functional equation. Um, these two Dirichlet series are related to each other. Um, they're, you, you can, yeah, you can, you can, write some relations between them, but, um, and I think, I, I think, I guess I would say for real part of S bigger than a half, or at least sufficiently large, um, these two things are, you can control one in terms of the other because um, sort of the correction factor should be absolutely convergent far enough to the, to the right. Um, but the, the overall plan here is to move things to the left. And so, since these things differ um, actually at, you know, at, um, uh, well, they differ at prime squares and, and higher. And so for every single prime, you're kind of off at the one over P to the two S uh, coefficient. And so that, that, that causes all sorts of uh, problems if you, if you, if you don't um, uh, correct that. So um, because of this, uh, it's better, um, oh, I'll, I guess I'll get to what, but this is, this is an issue that needs to be solved. Um, I guess I just wanted to mention, so what's the conductor here? Uh, so this is a this is a basic thing we should always do is sort out what the size of the conductor is. So the gamma factor of this rankin selberg is, so it has nine um, gamma factors and it's, um, and it, let's just assume Ramanujan, um, then these alphas are um, real numbers. And so you get a difference of these two. Um, and if we're in the small box, then what happens is it's like uh, 
you get nine of these differences, but three out of the nine basically cancel out up to big O of one or maybe big O of T to the epsilon. And then the other six are of size T. And so the conductor here is around T to the sixth. So um, if our length of summation is bigger than the square root of the conductor, then the functional equation should be good. So, so this explains why if N is bigger than T cubed, or T to the three plus epsilon, it should be better to apply the functional equation first and then apply the, the family averaging, like the wilmer buckane result. So this is what I just said. Um, okay, so how do we solve this problem of the, the coefficients being sort of wrong? Um, uh, so here's, here's one way to do this. Um, so let's define three norms. So delta one, that's our original um, norm that we're interested in with the lambda f of one n. These are the coefficients of the GL3 L function. Um, let's throw in a delta two. So delta two is similar, but we put in this, we put in an m and put in an m squared here. So it's not symmetric in m and n. Uh, it's, yeah, m, m, well, we have a square here, okay. And then um, delta three um, is similar to delta two, except we've allowed, put in this extra variable d here. And this is all to facilitate uh, getting to the object that we want, which would be the, 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 the actual rankin selberg l function. So now just by positivity, each one of these things is larger than or no smaller than the next one. So delta one is at most delta two, which is at most delta three. Okay, so if we want to bound delta one, we can bound delta three. Okay, so now let's put on a smooth bump function. And um, then when you square this out, we actually get the, the real rankin selberg l function. Okay, and so one of the nice things here is that, um, um, so I'm working on SL3Z, so not, not a congruent subgroup. And so there's no level. And so there's no um, ramified primes. Um, and so this is the correct L function. Thorner and Zeman work very hard to deal with more general levels. And then they have to uh, work very hard to handle um, sort of the bad Euler factors. Um, OK. So. Um, Great, so they, okay, so we're gonna do this. So we just open this up in terms of an L function. Then we want to shift contours to the left and apply the functional equation and then to change variables back. That's sort of what we mean by applying the functional equation and, and going back to sums. Um, we hit a pole at S equals one um, when, we, when we do this, um, but that only exists when F equals G and that gives a term of size N. So even though we've overextended going from delta one to delta three, we still, the, the, the polar term still is giving us a term of size N. So that's nice. Um, and so this N is, is what's matching the, the, the optimistic bound. So if N is large enough, then the optimistic bound is growing like N. And so that's uh, what we're looking for. Um, the functional equation, um, looks like this. So in the asymmetric form, it tells us that this L, this L function at one minus S is equal to this L function at S with a ratio of gamma factors. Um, if you, just as a heuristic, it's, it's, not, it's not too far off to think of this ratio of gamma factors as being like Q to the S minus a half, where Q is the conductor, that's T to the sixth. Um, this would, would follow from Sterling and from knowing how big all the alphas are, they're all in these little boxes. Um, okay, so that tells us that if we have this um, integral with the L function, um, by doing this process, we get um, a term of size N, and then um, we've replaced S by one minus S, so we're, we're one minus S here. This is the conductor term, W tilde, that's just the Mellon transform, um, this is at one minus S, and we've got the, the L function back. Just the roles of F and G are reversed, but that's um, not important. So now the plan is we're going to write the L function back in terms of the Dirichlet series coefficients. Um, we can then shift far off to the right to truncate the sum that in terms of the original variable S is like moving far off to the left. It's going really far off to the left to, to truncate. And then, and then once you've truncated, then you can um, put things more in a 
uh, towards the center of the critical strip or, or the edge of the critical strip. Um, and so, yeah, so basically you can truncate at the conductor over N, that's this, again, this basic duality principle, and so that's T to the sixth over N. So the dual sum can be truncated at T to the sixth over N. So in all, this, this in a hand wavy rough way, um, but not too far off from the truth, we should get some kind of inequality that says like our delta three at N is at most N, that's our kind of our, our diagonal, like our polar term, um, plus this N over T cubed, and then there's a delta three at a different length of summation, T to the sixth over N. And this should be beneficial if N is bigger than T cubed because the this, this, this sum gets shortened. Um, okay, I see I don't have much time left. Um, so I'll try to summarize uh, quickly. So what happens next? So what we did was we had delta one in terms of delta two, delta two in terms of delta three, and delta three, we, we did the functional equation, but we're really trying to bound delta one. So we've got to go back from delta three to delta one. And um, maybe just for purposes of time, I'll sort of skip over that, but it's, it's, it's basically using some Hecker relations um, the D sum is just done trivially, like that's, you can see this, this D variable, it doesn't appear anywhere in the sum. So that's just going to be summed over trivially. Um, but like if D is sort of big, that means M and N are sort of small. So there's a trade-off there. So that's what this, this relation is. We've got a Delta three in terms of Delta two by keeping track of how big this little D is. And then to get from Delta two to Delta one, we can use the Hecker relations to split apart this Lambda F of MN in, in terms of Lambda F of something comma one times lambda f of one comma something, and then use Cauchy-Schwartz. So this, this just some, I don't know, it's, 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 it's just some combinatorial type type things. So let's, let's skim over that. Um, so let's see, so what's the relation? So in the end, we relate, we get a delta one, in terms of delta ones with different lengths of summations, okay, uh, through that whole process. And then the final move is to apply the Lomer Buckheim bound that bounds delta one, but we're, we're bounding delta one with our new length of summation in a more favorable range. Um, and then after you just you know, do all the computations, it's just some, some algebra, you get, the, you get this result back. So, the other interesting thing, or like maybe the more interesting thing to, to, to mention is the, uh, I, I thought that it was very interesting that there's a, a connection between this whole thing and um, this, this whole SL3Z spectral large sieve and a, a result of Heath Brown um, that so far I haven't mentioned. Um, and I, I should say that uh, these ideas that I skimmed over quickly, like relating Delta one to Delta two, Delta two to Delta three and so on, is um, inspired by this paper of Heath Brown from 2000. So what is this? Um, so Heath Brown's result is about um, cubic characters and it's working over this number field. So um, e, uh, Q adjoin a cube root of unity. Um, so M and N run, run over elements in this, um, the ring of integers of this number field and denotes the norm. And so these are the, this is the cubic residue symbol um, and we've got let's say that N and, N and Q go up to some ranges. Um, and he gets this bound, this M plus Q, and then he's got this funny term, this M times Q to the two thirds. And so if M is quite large or Q is quite large, then M and or Q respectively dominate here and it matches the optimistic bound. But if M and Q are kind of close to each other, then the M Q to the two thirds term dominates and, and then, um, uh, anyway, that, that's what this bound is. And we don't know um, if this term should be there or not. Like we don't, uh, we don't know if there's a lower bound that matches this. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I don't, I think I've verbally conjectured in the past that it's deletable, um, <laughs> that the optimistic bound should be true. Um, but um, I'm not, I don't know what to believe at this point. I think it's an interesting question to even conjecture what is the truth in this problem. Um, just for purposes of time, maybe I won't spell out exactly how these two families are related, but that's something that um, I do in the paper. This is a preprint on the archive. 
Um, anyway, these things they're very much going parallel. And um, so some of these um, ideas of Heath Brown that applied to this problem were adaptable to the, the spectral large set problem. So let's just um, skip through all that and just say uh, thanks for uh, listening.